can start. Okay, good evening, everyone. So today we'll be discussing regarding national environmental policies to achieve sustainable development. And we'll be reviewing these policies uh, with present scenario and what kind of amendments have been introduced latest uh, in our uh, regular rules and regulation system. So yesterday we had uh, discussed regarding the environmental governance at international platform. So today we'll be discussing regarding the national environmental policies, which have come up through uh, different kind of uh, deliberations at international level. So the objectives of uh, today's presentation, outline of the today's presentation will be constitutional measures for the protection and preservation of environment will be discussed. Then legislative measures through environmental laws in India the Indian Forest Act 1927 and the Forest Conservation Act 1980 and the main acts, uh, the Water Pol Prevention and Control of Pollution Act, Water Prevention and Control of Pollution, CES Act, then Air Prevention and Control of Pollution, then Environment Protection Act 1986, which is an umbrella act and it encompasses in itself many other rules and regulations for protection of environment. And then Public Liability Insurance Act, that also we had discussed yesterday in agenda of public uh, assurance and how compensation to deprived and affected persons is important and how it reflects in our national policies. So uh, all these acts and rules which we are going to discuss today, they are basically a trickle down effect of international governance and international deliberations on the issues of environment and sustainable development. Then we have National Environmental Tribunal Act, Panchayat Extension to Scheduled Areas Act, the National Environment Appellate Authority Act, then protection of plant varieties and farmers' rights, the Biodiversity Act. So uh, basically uh, these acts are the significant acts and rules in the uh, area of environment management and sustainable development. But apart from these significant rules and guidelines, there are around uh, 200 guidelines and 200 rules and regulations which directly or indirectly can come under, under the purview of environment management. So uh, if you do some uh, in-depth uh, study of environmental rules and regulations, and uh, the cases which have been already run in Supreme Court and High Court, then you will get to know what are the different uh, arenas of rules and regulations where environment can again be covered. So in uh, India is an original signatory to the Declaration of United Nations Conference held in Stockholm in 1972. So being an original signatory to this uh, conference and uh, being a party to uh, conserve environment and protect environment in the long run, it has to issue the guidelines for protection of environment and sustainable use. So this attention was received in our planning process in the early 1970s only. So after fourth five-year plan, that is from 1968 to 73, there was an, uh, a recognition of integrating environmental dimensions into planning and development processes. And our government then started adopting various measures for conservation, for upgradation, as well as for the protection of environment. So as per the constitutional provisions which were introduced in, a, in a, our constitution for conservation of environment, we have implemented through environmental protection laws of our country. So there, are, there is a large body of laws and regulations, and these laws are enacted by central and state governments. So as well as uh, judicial decisions are implemented by a number of tribunals these days. So National Green Tribunal is also acting very fiercely for the protection of environment and for uh, attending the issues which are practically uh, be, uh, uh, which are practically being encountered by the communities, by the industries, uh, in in even in the government department. Okay, so uh, this 
uh, rule and regulation uh, dimension is not restricted to common man or industrialists or agriculturalists. It can also cover government departments. If they are not doing something which is as per their mandate, then they are also liable to act as per the guidelines. Then objectives as per if you uh, go through this unit, after uh, going through this presentation and this unit, you will be able to understand what is the legislative framework and environmental laws of India. What is the reason and objective of framing these laws? And what were the landmark judgments which basically provided, provided a direction to the industries, to the community, as well as to the masses who are stakeholders of environment? Okay. So as per constitutional measures, we have specific provisions which are there for the protection of environment. And we discussed yesterday also. So as per the 42nd uh, Amendment Act in 1976, we introduced this obligated duty of every state and every citizen that we, we have to protect our environment and improve environment our environment. So as a citizen of India, it is my obligation under this uh, 42nd amendment as per the directive principles of state policy also we have specific provisions which enunciate that states commitment should be there for protection of environment so even if there is no specific rule and guideline then also if this constitutional uh, provision is taken care of then also it is abiding to every citizen to and it's an obligation for every citizen to take care of any measure which protects environment. So every state has to and make endeavors to protect and improve the environment, to safeguard the forest, wildlife, as well as water resources, air quality. Then it is also a duty of citizen as per Article 51 AG. And this article specifically tells you that it is duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, wildlife. And you should also have compassion for all living creatures in our country. So it, our country is uh, very uh, active in uh, making these constitutional provisions because it, our country was the first country in the world which has provided these safeguards for the protection and preservation of the environment. So as the legislative measures, so central ministry is there because to run any kind of system, you need some institutional mechanism. You need some people who take the responsibility. You need some people who are given authority. You need some departments who are actually given the responsibility of monitoring, designing, controlling, and implementing all these rules and regulations. So for that purpose, Central Ministry of Environment and Forest uh, in consultation with ministries of urban and rural development and roads and highways, they started making policies and plans for uh, to be implemented at the state and lower levels, at local levels, regional levels. And Central Pollution Control Board was named, was defined as technical arm. So they were responsible for uh, providing all the uh, notification standards as well as the levels of pollution which can be allowed by various kind of industries and which can which are tolerable for ensuring a sustenance of living beings human beings plants animals so all those kinds of uh, standards and notifications were defined by central pollution control board so at the state level, we have state pollution control boards, which is again a branch of central pollution control board acting at the state level. And at in rural areas, we have grand, grand panchayats and uh, road transport authorities. Uh, then we have central laws, which are controlling and which are uh, designing environmental parameters for air, water, soil, solid waste, even for the few, few, uh, flu gases for stack emissions, for DG sets, there are different standards for uh, uh, ozone, there are different standards for greenhouse gases, there are different standards. So all those standards are being controlled by central pollution control laws. So uh, then the judiciary of the, uh, 
if we if we face any kind of uh, not law about law abiding activity or which is defying any kind of rule and regulation we we can approach supreme court at the central level we have high court at the state level and we have judicial magistrates as well as tribunals at lower levels so if these courts examine your complaint filed under the environment laws and apart from that you have a major uh, tool for uh, exercising your power as a citizen of this country under public interest litigation so at for many of the social causes for many of the causes for uh, different kind of stakeholders people who don't even are having any stake in that area can also uh, file a complaint through public interest litigation if they are really concerned and if they really want to debate on any policy guidelines or and project which is harming the environment okay so for the this purpose higher courts can direct any executive agency in a particular way so as per the constitutional provisions uh, which are implemented uh, through environment environmental uh, protection law so basically the all the amendments are revised by ministry of environment and forest now no, also known as ministry of environment forest and climate change so the central parliament approves these laws and at the center and the st state state levels for implementation so this is the overall institutional structure or the regulatory structure which guides environmental protection in our in india so uh, whatever we have discussed in the last five slides that is being uh, described picture uh, pictorially here so central ministries are notifying national laws then judiciary are interpreting those laws and taking care whether uh, anybody is uh, punishable under that law or not then environmental and forest uh, department is there which is again working al along with central pollution control board urban and rural development shipping roads transport and highways so under judiciary we have supreme court state high courts and judicial magistrates so after state level uh, bodies we have a uh, field level agencies for direct implementation municipalities and panchayat raj and regional offices of environment and forest at the second level okay so at the top level we have environment and forest the central uh, agency which which is having office in delhi and at an uh, regional levels we have environment and forest departments in every state again after that we have zonal offices and regional offices and local municipal and village authorities regional transport authorities which take care of vehicular air pollution so basically this whole structure uh smoothly updates and uh, it takes care of all the institutional requirement and we have given clear responsibilities and authorities to each and every department so that our environmental laws are abided by by all the concerned stakeholders so coming to our uh, the first law which was introduced at the time of british india period uh, so basically when uh, british india uh, the indian forest act came up in 1927 after an aftermath of sepoy mutiny in 1857 so during this period forest and forest dwelling communities were uh, providing rebel rebe uh, rebellions a very safe and hiding place so uh, east india company started prohibiting and withdrawing the ss rights of the local communities who were living in the vicinity of these forest places so that they can uh, take care of the uh, rebellions and they can just uh, control their entry and exit in these forest areas so to legitimize their control they, through scientific operations they in, uh, introduced a series of instruments in the form of forest act so at that time if you uh, uh you, you will understand that at that time forest act was not actually made for protection of forest it was actually made to leg legitimize control of british uh, britishers on our forest resources so and finally in 1927 indian forest act was formulated so number of forest acts came from 1865 to 1970 27 and after that indian forest act came into picture so with independence local 
dependent people expected that now we should be given our rights back because Britishers have uh, left our country. So our uh, uh, original rights uh, to access to resources of these forests should be given back to us. So in 1947 and 1970, there was a phase of commercial ex exploitation of forests for industrial development after this, uh, these rights were given partially. So this lasted till the commencement of 1988 national forest policy. So up till that period, due to uh, initiation of industrialization in our country, a lot of deforestation was taking place on large scale. So to control that, to check, check the further deforestation of our forest resources, the president promulgated uh, 20, on 25th October an ordinance that is forest conservation ordinance. So that came, uh, uh, that was later replaced by Forest Conservation of 1980. And it was further amended uh, in 1988. And in 2003, the Forest Conservation Rules came up. So there is a lot of history attached to the uh, initial uh, and environment related law that is Indian Forest Act of 1927. So uh, under state, what are the powers that are given under this act? So under this act, state government has a power that it can declare a forest as a forest, it can declare a wasteland, it can declare a reserve forest as a protected area. Okay. So after it is declared a protected area, the state government has a right to restrict the use of forest resources by any community live thriving or inhabiting uh, uh, areas around the vicinity of that uh, forest. So there, are, then it can also prohibit certain actions like making fresh clearance of forest area for agricultural purposes, for industrial purposes, or for any other purpose. And then it can not be set on fire. That reserved area cannot be set on fire without any permission and it cannot allow trespassing or cattle grazing or any damage to trees or quarrying or mining of stones or clearing or breaking up of land, hunting or shooting of fish if it is having a water body uh, within its uh, uh, premises. Then all killing and all uh, killing and uh, catching of elephants was also prohibited. So in protected forest, basically, uh, with the help of this act, we are preserving our natural forest resources. And if somebody wants to uh, do it in a scientific manner, somebody wants to uh, utilize these forest, forest resources in a scientific manner, they have to apply uh, to the forest department. They can be granted licenses to the uh, inhabitants of towns and villages, and they can use that forest produce for their own purpose or for the purpose of trade. But it has to be an, in a regulated manner, not just haphazardly uh, deforesting and uh, destroying the forest resources for their own personal use. So for de-reservation of any forest land also, or for use of any forest purpose, state government should take permission from the center. Okay, So a state government has been given partial uh, authority in this uh, under this act, but the, to de-reserve any forest land, again, it has to take permission from the center. So then central government will constitute a committee and it will advise the state government whether it should go for that non-forest purpose and de-reservation of that forest land or it should not go. But after independence and rapid urbanization, there was a committee set up in 1962 and this, the report of this committee was circulated to every state and central level uh, self-government. Then again, uh, it was agreed to have a single law for the prevention and control of water pollution for the central as well as the state level. So how this water prevention and control of pollution act came into picture because of the severe pollution of rivers and streams. Okay, so basically, if you see uh, these laws and uh, policies, they came up because of some kind of international agreement. Again, when some kind of issues are needed to be resolved with a particular resource, for example, in forest areas, British India started that forest, uh, forest act. But when water pollution started, then also state and central and self-local uh, governments were circulated a report and a single law was formulated for central as well as the state level. 
but if you see from the significance point of view you will realize that without we cannot live without air even for few seconds we can live without water without forest for few days few months but uh, for for without water we can live for few days and without forest we can uh, survive for few months but without air we cannot survive but uh, this air prevention and control of pollution act came far back far uh, after the other acts and rules guidelines were made so uh, these rules and uh, they were the need of the hour whenever there was an, an urgent need to draft a uh, draft an act this came up so draft bill was prepared in 1965 and finally passed by both the houses of parliament on 23rd march so it was a comprehensive legislation which was uh, for the prevention and control of water pollution as the name denotes for of this act so uh, this acts provided for the first time central pollution control board and st uh, state pollution control board came into picture with this uh, water pollution uh, the water prevention and control of pollution act so they were uh, clearly defined functions of central board as well as the state boards under this act and they were also given powers to give technical assistance and guidance to state boards carry out and research and investigation and set the state standards for pollution levels okay so uh, after this state board was also given executive and territorial functions they they were given powers to plan Uh, how to uh, control pollution of streams and wells they were given power for advising state governments they were given power to inspect any kind of effluent stream of any industry uh, if they observe that this industry is polluting uh, rivers and streams uh, existing in that area or even if they have not employed any wastewater treatment plants or their treatment plants are not functioning properly So they were given power to straight away go to that industry and inspect their effluent streams. So for setting up of standards, also there were uh, joint boards for two or more contiguous states. And in case of any dispute between two states, central board was given the authority to arbitrate. So it was very important provision which came into picture and it paved a way for further. acts and guidelines because it it uh, guided the setting up of an institutional mechanism it guided the setting up of central pollution control boards and state pollution control boards even the qualifications of the members of these boards was given under this act so uh, again there were certain rights given under this act they can obtain information regarding construction installation of treatment and disposal system they can take samples of trade effluent and they can enter and inspect any industrial establishment record check their records register their uh, details document their uh, details or even take um, uh, take photographs so that they can check their uh, pollution stream in future for uh, taking of whether they have taken any corrective action or not and they can also prohibit use of stream or sewer or land and if they are not abiding by the standards uh, declared by pollution control board they can also restrain or prohibit that industry from discharging any poisonous noxious or polluting matter they can refuse or withdraw consent so before any industry starts its operation it has to take a consent consent to operate consent to establish okay so first it it takes consent to establish after establishment it takes consent to operate and that consent needs to be revised after every regular period whenever it gets expired you have to uh, apply reapply for that consent before expiring of that consent as per the uh, water prevention and control of pollution act so for that purpose if uh, any industry is making any pollution to restrain that industry it uh, pollution control boards have also given a power to make an application to the local court okay so again it is a responsibility of industry under this there was responsibility given to state boards central boards there were authorities given there were powers given to state boards and again there was there were responsibility given to industry also to furnish any information to the pollution control board 
then industry can also appeal if some uh, uh, state board is making any kind of complaint which is not acceptable to industry they can also appeal to the appellate authority and in case of grievances against the order they can uh, refuse or withdraw uh, withdrawal of their consent they can tell uh, ask the court or authority to intervene in the matter and take the correct action so uh, you can uh, just develop with the overview of these laws and acts we can understand our laws and acts are fully equipped with all the tools and strategies to control pollution so it is as per the international uh, standards of laws and regulations in other countries as well then coming to water prevention and control of pollution cess act so as the name denotes uh, this act was uh, introduced mainly to augment the financial resources and financial strength of state and central pollution control boards because by levying a cess on water consumed by a specific industry as per schedule 1 of the act they were able to co collect some revenue for the state government and central government and that cess was credited into a consolidated fund of india so any industry which installs and operates its effluent treatment plant it is entitled to a rebate also that is 25 percent of the payable cess so this is a kind of market-based instrument it is a kind of a financial instrument which was introduced way back in 1977 to this cess act and it gave a, uh, uh, it gave a benefit to the industry which is operating its effluent treatment plant in a proper manner. So then came our air prevention and control of pollution acts. So this act came after United Nations Conference of 1972. So after uh, when in 1972 we were we had committed to preserve natural resources of our country under this Stockholm conference. Then in 18, 1981, Indian government decided to take up this act. And they also, uh, they also witnessed that as per the NIRI, uh, National Environmental Engineering Research Institute, which was at that time the most reputed uh, research organization in environmental engineering. So they uh, submitted a data of uh, three metropolitan cities, Calcutta, Mumbai, and Delhi. At that time, it was called Bombay. So uh, Calcutta, Mumbai, Bombay, Delhi data has shown uh, degradation of air quality. So finally, this Air Act was passed by both the Houses of Parliament on 29th March 1981 after uh, Stockholm Conference of 1972. Again, as again uh, similar to Water Act, there were uh, set set uh, uh, Act also provides for the setting up of central and state uh, boards for prevention and control of air pollution. So within the state and central board, uh, when they were defined in under Water Act, a department for air pollution prevention and control of pollution was also defined as per this act. And all UTs, uh, un union territories, the, uh, the CPCB was empowered to perform its functions of, as a state pollution control board. So in st while the state governments, they were uh, consulting for respective state boards and they were empowered to declare air pollution control areas. So wherever there is a level of air pollution, which is critical to the health of a community inhabiting that area, they can declare that pollution uh, area as air pollution control area and in such area you cannot establish or operate any new industrial plant uh, and without obtaining the consent so without obtaining consent as such also nobody can start its operations but in that controlled area new industries can also uh, cannot come up uh, without taking consent of the consent state board so uh, before the passage of the and um, uh, then came up the environment protection act 1986 so this act was passed after bhopal gas tragedy only so after in during bhopal gas tragedy it was observed that these air acts and water acts were there 
to control pollution but there was no specific act for providing any kind of uh, uh, provisions for industrial and environment safety and eventualities of accidents and there was no provision of providing compensation to the affected parties in case of any environmental uh, hazard or any environmental accident so there was a need of uh, an umbrella legislation which can cover all aspects of all gaps gaps of environmental legislation which were left out by air and water act so a bill was passed in 23rd may 1986 and this act came into picture uh, as environment protection act and uh, this the, there were specific provisions under this act to take all necessary measures for protecting the quality of the environment for a nationwide program also they started planning and executing they could lay down standards for discharge of any kind of environment pollutants not just air water and they could recognize environmental laboratories under this act they could recognize government analysts under this act okay so with with this act there was many scientific scientists who were given uh, employment who were given opportunity to serve for the country and to uh, protect the environment so it was a uh, a very big turnover in the uh, in the arena of environment legislation and it also laid down standards for the quality of environment and to restrict areas lay down safeguards lay down procedures so uh, basically uh, this act empowered the action uh, for, to be taken up by the central government so under the section 5 of this uh, uh, environment protection act there were specific uh, powers which were delegated to both states and union territories so these rules were framed and they were notified uh, under specific sections for example there were rules that specify standard for emission and discharge of hazardous substances as well which were not attended before so all those uh, carrying an industry and operation or process and Oh, there were number of industries which were taking consent under water act and under air act so this act uh, also gave a uh, overview of authorization under hazardous waste management and handling acts and every industry was required to submit an environment statement in the prescri prescribed form that form is called form 5 okay so every industry like we submit our uh, income tax return every year in for the for a particular financial year similarly every industry was required to submit environmental statement so that statement uh, is in the format of form 5 and that form 5 requires all the information regarding how much pollution they are creating how much mitigation measure they are adopting what is the air pollution what is the water pollution all the parameters and their values are uh, required to be submitted to the concerned pollution control boards so under environment protection act of 1986 there were number of acts which uh, which were uh, uh, for formulated and hazardous waste management and handling rules 1989 is one of them so uh, now we will be discussing all the rules which came under environment protection act so the, the these acts and these rules identify categories which are producing hazardous waste or which are using hazardous waste so they have to provide an inventory how much hazardous waste is there how much uh, control handling and disposal disposal they are taking care of and they need to seek authorization before they start their operations before they start generating any waste they need authorization from concerned state pollution control board and uh, there is again a format for that authorization application and then you have to de give details how much will be my production how much uh, projection of waste is there how i am going to treat it how i am going to uh, control its uh, disposal and there there has so for that purpose it was uh, suggested that common treatment facilities should be uh, designed in every state so uh, this rule actually paved a way for uh, identifying the needs of hazardous waste management in our country 
so common treatment facilities came into picture so many operators and many industries they started establishing common treatment facilities so in those common treatment facilities all the small scale industries who cannot do treatment of hazardous waste at their own individual level they can give charges to these common treatment facilities and they, these facilities can treat their uh, waste in a scientific manner they can treat, treat and dispose of their waste as per the guidelines of state pollution control rules so again uh, there was treatment of the waste at the premises which could could have been done and there is a uh, option of treatment at common treatment facilities so again for there were rules for packaging labeling transportation even while transportation what kind of details have to be provided over the transportation vehicle truck or trolley or tanker whichever uh where is taking uh, transporting that hazardous waste from the manufacturing industry to the treatment facility okay again uh import of hazardous waste from any other country for treatment and processing in our country was also required to be approved by central government okay so otherwise it would be sent to the expo exporting country by at their own expense by that processing facility then came municipal solid waste now this municipal solid waste has a number of uh, branches uh, plastic waste management guidelines uh, construction and demolition waste guidelines e waste is also there then you have a uh, hazard uh, waste earlier uh, this municipal solid waste was having uh, together encompassing plastic as well as construction demolition waste so it they gave responsibilities under this act to the municipality that you have to do collection storage transportation processing as well as the disposal of the solid waste and for example even the segregation of municipal solid waste was the responsibility of the mc so for that purpose they need to segregate recycle and give awareness to the local resident welfare associations through ngos and then came the noise pollution control act so now now the noise pollution is again a part of ambient air quality standards so with respect to noise levels they were specified and officers of spcb and cpcb they were required to enforce these noise noise quality standards and they could also uh, they had also the power to prohibit any kind of continuous noise and there were timings given so uh, the night time as per this law starts from 10 pm at the night till 6 am in the morning so any person who is uh, uh, using loud speakers and violating specific standards under these guidelines is uh, required to take permission from the authorities okay so even during festive season they need special permissions so after that uh, in montreal port protocol on 17 september 2000 the ods substances the ozone depleting substances they were uh, controlled and they were controlled under the rules of ozone depleting substances regulation and control rules 2000 so they under these acts no person can produce ozone depleting substance any kind of ods was prohibited to be produced uh, until he is registered with moef and the quantity of production was also specified so, so there were restrictions and prohibitions on Im, uh, on import of such products and every entity that produces imports exports sells and purchases uh, receives fin financial assistance from international organization so again it was a kind of benefit or it was a kind of uh, a subsidy or assistance that was provided to the uh, any entity which produces imports exports sells and purchases or has the facility to reclaim or destroy ozone depleting substances so uh, this rule controlled both ways so the person who are producing these ods they were also controlled and the person who could reclaim or destroy ods to make uh, to restrain uh, it from making further damage to the environment they were given financial assistance so again the plastics manufacture sale and usage rule came in 1999 which was amended in 2003 so all the state pollution control boards and central pollution control board uh, in union territories they were given a 
enforce these rules and as per these rules not uh, no uh, polythene bags or plastic bags were allowed which were which were lower than the thickness of 20 microns okay so why uh, is why is there so much restriction on the size and thickness of plastics because if you see uh, the, the plastics which are heavier in uh, weight or which are, which are larger in size they are heavier in weight and you can control and you can uh, devise a mechanism for their collection. But as the size of plastic uh, goes down, as the thickness of plastic goes down, it is very difficult and a laborious task to collect that kind of plastic waste. So even the rack pickers, even the waste collectors, they were finding difficulty in collecting this small size of microns and they don't have even any uh, benefit in getting these because they are from the marginalized group and they depend on collection of these kind of waste because they generate income from these waste and that income is based on the per kg weight of the waste they are collecting so they leave out the small size plastic waste that is lying on the streets on on the landfills even in our community areas so uh, that's why these guidelines were devised so that small size uh, plastic or uh, uh, plastic which is lower than thickness of 20 microns can be restrained from production okay so manu then again manufacturers were required to print on each packet whether it is made from recycled material or virgin plastic and uh, this guideline was based on an, uh, on the scientific uh, idea of that if a virgin plastic is uh, is used for production of that packet then it can be again recycled but it is if it is already a recycled material it is more polluting because of the number of uh, coloring pigments which have been used for uh, again recycling that product so to get an idea about what kind of plastic is that and how much plastic thickness can be used so these guidelines were all given under plastic manufacturing scale and usage rules of 1999 and which were amended in 2003 and recently also they have been amended in 2022. So all carry bags and containers made of virgin plastic, they should be natural shade or white. They, there was certain uh, uh, criteria for use of pigment colors, only BIS standard specified coloring agents can be used and manufacturing of carry bags or containers of virgin plastic or recycled plastic, again, both require an application to SPCB. So uh, the, now this whole process of applying for any kind of uh, operation or any kind of industrial establishment, this helps in controlling uh, the pollution levels. How? Because the Pollution Control Committee has a data how much industries are uh, inhabiting in that region, how much industries are legally operating and how much industries are illegally operating. So if they don't have all that data of how much uh, pollution is being generated in my state, they cannot devise strategies to control that pollution level. And if uh, illegally or the uh, industries who have not applied to SPCB, they grow in number, then also they get to know, okay, uh, the, the pollution level has risen more than the expected levels, more than the projections. And this, this is because of certain industries which are not abiding by the rules and regulations and to take corrective action, to take legal action under the law for against those uh, agencies and against those industries. So in as per the latest amendment of plastic waste management 2022, we have four categories of plastic waste. One is rigid, one is flexible, then multi-layered, and those plastic sheets which are made of compost, uh, composite plastics. So uh, these uh, four categories, again, they, they are required to, gen to generate more data on different kind of plastic material which is there in our country and to devise certain technologies for recycling and disposal of the, these kind of plastic materials. So again, every industry who is packaging any kind of waste and selling it in the market is required to collect back, back those empty packets. So that is under the extended producer responsibility. And this is again a part of uh, Plastic Waste Management Amendment Rules 2016. 
okay so but uh, after 2016 many industries they didn't take up it seriously so again this uh, this categorization was done in 2022 so that the industries are uh, they can easily understand what is required to be done by their uh, under their responsibility and uh, under extended producer responsibility they have to get certificates from pros public responsibility organi uh, organization so uh, as a uh, sorry producer responsibility organization so as pro are given responsibility to collect back all the material plastic which is lying in the market through these brand owners so under this act new act uh, producer importer as well as brand owners are covered for collecting back all the plastic waste that is being generated through them by the consumers so uh, again all these rules and guidelines they are based on the polluter pays principle as we had studied it under uh, agenda 21 uh, yesterday so as per agenda 21 anyone who is making a damage to the uh, environment is liable to pay for the damage it has caused so that is the basic principle polluter pays principle which is again utilized under uh, uh, while framing these rules and guidelines and for non fulfillment of epr targets also producer importers and brand owners they need to uh, protect and improve the quality of the environment so a committee was constituted by central pollution control board and under the chairmanship of uh, cpcb chairman they have to recommend measures how it can implement epr extended producer responsibility guidelines so uh, there is another act uh, which is uh, independent act so all those acts which were covered under environment protection act of 1986 we have discussed them now coming to independent uh, acts which also govern other aspects of environment we come to the public liability insurance act so as the name suggest it is basically to provide liability insurance for the purpose of providing immediate relief to the persons affected ap's affect uh, ap's are basically affected persons by any accident by any chemical uh, tragedy or accident or leakage or by any accident due to mishandling of hazardous substances or waste oils so all those kind of hazardous substances if they are uh, released or if they are accidentally causing damage to the people living in uh, um, in the vicinity of that industry so that industry's owner are having this duty to take necessary insurance policy so that they can discharge their liabilities they can provide funds for the relief of the persons who are affected by the accident caused in their industry so the central government has established an environment relief fund in 2008 and under this fund also they are, they are utilizing pay and paying in accordance with the provisions of the act so then in 1995 a uh, national environment tribunal came up and it is basically uh, uh, formulated for established and formulated for the purpose of providing faster relief and compensation under the environment related uh, tragedies and accidents and the uh, it was enacted with a view to giving relief for all the damages to persons property and environment which have which are victims of any kind of impact of hazardous substance or any uh, an industrial mishandling and any industrial damages that are caused to the environment so the compensation uh, will be given to the victim after receiving a claim through application to the tribunal so any person who is having any kind of uh, damage through any industry can apply under the tribunal and uh, for and get the compensation so whosoever fails to comply with any order made by the tribunal shall, shall be punishable with imprisonment so if an owner fails to comply or give compensation to the affected persons he will get he or she will get an imprisonment for 3 years or a fine which can extend to 10 lakh rupees or it can be both as well so uh, again we have panchayat extension to scheduled areas act for rural areas for securing property rights of rural areas in case any industrialist uh, 
uh, set up their industry in that rural area and damages their environment, damages their culture and harms their integral uh, authenticity. So that this is basic uh, called PESA Act, PESA 1996. So this PESA 1996 was uh, designed to alter the power balance between the state governments and the tribes. Because most of the times these tribes were, uh, they were not very effective in participation and they had, uh, the state governments had a tendency to monopolize their power and they, they use that power uh, to control the people living in those tribes and indigenous uh, uh, localities in certain states of our country. So these indigenous people, uh, tribes are also defined as per uh, constitution of India and as per census survey. So uh, again, uh, for in some states, there are no indigenous tribes and people, but in some states of Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh and Northeast areas, there are indigenous tribes which are protected under PESA 1996. So parliament exercised its reserved legislative authority to extend these provisions of part nine of the constitution. So part nine of the constitution is reserved for panchayas for scheduled areas also. Okay. So any kind of habitation or hamlet which is having uh, and managing its affairs with certain uh, indigenous traditions and customs and it is having a reserving reserving is ethnicity so that there there is uh, we could not exercise a lim they could exercise limited self government of their own okay so under that uh, parliament uh, cannot exercise okay or the state level bodies uh, then state legislation on panchayas shall be in consonance with customary laws social and religious practices again for preserving traditions and uh, customs gram sabha shall also work with the people uh, to preserve their cultural identity so these were also uh, uh, responsibilities given to rural areas and gram sabhas and panchayas under this pisa 1996 so uh, again, uh, it vested some powers as well. So uh, as uh, in tandem with the responsibilities that were given under the act, there were certain powers also given under this act. So before uh, taking up any land acquisition, they have to do consultation for development projects and before resettling or rehabilitating persons affected by such projects and they should prevent alienation of land in scheduled areas and they should also take appropriate action to restore the, these alienated lands of scheduled tribes. So then came the National Environment Appellate Authority Act. Okay, so uh, this act was, uh, this act was uh, provided uh, for the uh, appeals to be heard and to respect to the restriction of areas in which any particular class of industries shall not carry out their operations. To, so to certain, uh, to subject these, uh, or they should carry out these activities subject to certain safeguards. Okay, so uh, any person who is aggrieved by any order given by any environmental clearance to the industry. So in uh, Air Pollution Act also, in Water Pollution Act also, we discussed that even the industry who is given any orders to of closure or uh, given any orders to establish uh, effluent treatment plant or pollution control devices, they can make an appeal to Environment Appellate Authority if they feel that the, the, this uh, direction given by state body is not justifiable, if they are not making any kind of pollution and still pollution control board is asking to deploy any kind of technology, they could also appeal. For that purpose, Environment Appellate Authority was uh, defined under uh, National Environment Appellate Authority Act of 1997. So it is basically giving an opportunity to the appellant of being heard and the court can pass orders as it sees fit. 
So again, we have protection of plant varieties and farmers' rights act. So this act again in 2001, PP VFR act in short abbreviated form it is called. So this PP VFR act came to provide for establishment of effective system for protection of certain plant varieties because breeders were developing new kind of varieties and uh, farmers have rights to adopt these new kind of varieties so that they can increase their production they can increase their income and they can provide better produce to the market but the broad objective of this act was to encourage and development of new plant varieties and as well as to select uh, to preserve the uh, original plant varieties as well Okay, so it was necessary to protect the rights of farmers and plant breeders who are contributing uh, to development of new varieties. Because if somebody is investing uh, their resources in and uh, taking risk of introducing new plant varieties, they should also be given protection. Their rights should also be protected. So the main features under this was the farmer's rights include registration of his own variety. So if they have developed some new variety through their own breeding technique, they can uh, register their own variety. And on failure, farmer or village or uh, local communities can claim compensation in a prescribed manner before the authority. And again, researchers are allowed to use any kind of registered variety. So any citizen from a conventional country is entitled for breeders right to a variety. Okay. So uh, after this, there was also a national gene fund was established and it was credited with the benefit sharing received. So annual fees, compensations, contributions from various national and international bodies. And also there were certain practices which were supported in ex situ conservation and in situ conservation. So yesterday also we were discussing regarding the introduction of new tiger species in our country. So all such kind of new genes and national uh, uh, are supported by national gene fund. Okay. So central government can also establish plant varieties, protection appellate tribunal uh, authorities, and they have uh, specific persons, chairpersons, and judicial and technical members who are heading these authorities. Again, uh, the Biological Diversity Act 2002 came up. We are only, uh, as we have only 2.5% of the total land area. And this is accounting for 7 to 8% of the recorded species of the world. So compared to the land area, which is 2.5%, we are having a higher value of recorded species. And we are also part of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was uh, declared in 1992. So with concern to all these issues, we, this act came into picture in 2002 so that the, the issue concerning access to genetic resources can be resolved and we can have associated knowledge by foreign individuals, institutions. And with uh, because for sharing of any uh, knowledge with international parties and international organizations, we need to be at par in terms of rules and regulations at international level. So we, we were lacking in this uh, arena and we devised this Biological Diversity Act so that we can also uh, address the issues concerning with genetic resources and how we can exchange knowledge on international platform with foreign individuals and institutions. So basically, NBA was started, National Biodiversity Authority was started. This was the main provision of this act. And the, similar to Water Act and Air Act, where the SPCBs and CPCBs were uh, established as per those acts and rules. Here also, an institutional mechanism was set up and three ex-official members from tribal affairs, from environment forest, and five non-official members who were scientists and specialists in their subject matter, they headed the, uh, they formed a uh, part of this National Biodiversity Authority. And its head office is located in Chennai and there are many regional offices in other places of India. So they will, they are supposed to, uh, as, as per their functions, they are supposed to advise central government 
on matters related to conservation of biodiversity and they can also advise state government for selection of areas of biodiversity importance which area should be in a restricted uh, way which area should be used for ex situ conservation which area should be uh, con converted into national park or protected forest area okay so again this authority on behalf of central government has uh, rights to grant international intellectual property rights ipr rights okay so they can give these ip rights in any country outside india on any biological resource obtained from india or knowledge associated with that biological resource specifically to uh, so many medicinal plants which are available and the knowledge which is there with indigenous tribes and people in indian uh, forest areas and biodiversity rich areas so any person uh, who is not citizen and who is not registered in india who is not a resident of india they cannot just take uh, or transfer the knowledge from india to any other uh, area uh, associated with research or commercial utilization without approval of biodiversity authority so again this was a very important provision and any person who is aggrieved by any determination of benefit they can also apply to the appellate authority and appeal to the high court so after discussing these significant rules and guidelines under uh, our national environmental legislation there are some landmark cases which we need to study and which paved the way for future uh, regulations and guidelines and future uh, uh, guidelines for determining the restricted areas for determining the control of pollution and for determining strategies for banning uh, you for of use of polluting resources okay so uh, this one of this case is taj mahal case with, which is taj mahal as all of us know it is one of the wonders of the world and it is the utmost pride of india and it was facing a pollution due to mathura refinery iron foundries glass and other chemical industries so as a result of sanctions uh, from these industries there was a, a serious threat to taj mahal due to acid rain so its color, uh, it was getting decolorized there was a, layer, a yellow color layer that was forming over the top layer of uh, marble that was used for uh, construction of taj mahal and a petition was filed in the year 1984 by mc mehta he is the uh, pioneer environment legislator in india so the supreme court of india delivered a historic judgment in december 1996 and it gave various directions to apex court to uh, in, uh, which use included banning of use of coal uh, and directing industries to switch to compressed natural gas so this it, it was a trapezium zone a trapezium shaped zone was identified which was which covered an area of 10400 square meter and no uh, industries number of industries were there and no new industries were uh, were allowed to get uh, come into that area okay so strict steps were taken to protect taj mahal from turning yellow due to reactions involving acid rain in the form of rain with the white marble so this was again uh, this is again a pictorial representation of the trapezium which was defined around taj mahal and the study was done again by uh, agra environmental assessment was uh, done and again a study was done by niri so uh, this uh, uh, row wind rose chart again shows you how the, it is basically a static uh, statistical representation of uh, wind speed and wind direction as per the data the uh, original data based data uh, recovered from indian meteorological department in that uh, time so in agra wind mostly blows from west to east so the zone which has more buffer on the west of taj to ensure that polluting factories are away from it so that's why its shape is trapezium shape okay so again uh, there is another case Uh, ganges pollution case and in uh, sorry in uh, taj mahal trapezium zone also i want to uh, let you know that today also uh, i was recently given a case of uh, of a hospital who wanted to expand their options and get environment clearance revised 
for the expanded area and expanded operations. For that purpose also, we submitted a report to uh, head office MOEFCC, which is a central body for looking into any kind of uh, new projects which are coming, which are not under the purview of uh, environment clearance because of this uh, Taj Mahal case, this defining of Taj trapezium zone, no industry can still come in that area. So we prepared a report and we submitted all the related documents and data about how the hospital will be working and what kind of pollution it can emit and how it will be controlling all that pollution. So only source of pollution was DG set. But again, the, due to continuous power supply, the DG set was utilized only twice or thrice a year. And that DG set was also environment friendly green uh, DG set, which was having latest technology to control all kind of air and noise. But still uh, that hospital has, was not given a, a, a green signal for expansion. So that is the uh, purview which can be extended through are these uh, cases, real life cases and landmark cases. So again, in Ganga pollution case, there were three landmark judgments and number of orders were passed. More than 50,000 uh, industries which were polluting Ganga Basin, they were given clear directions to control their pollution and to put up sewage treatment plant. So until they put up sewage treatment plant, they were not allowed to reopen. Okay, so either they had to uh, lower down their pollution levels and establish affluent treatment plant or they will not be allowed to open. So many uh, people were saved from ill effects of air and water pollution due to this landmark case of Ganga pollution case and 600 tanneries which were uh, operating in Kolkata, they were shifted out of the city in a planned uh, leather complex. So many special are now being defined in our country where they have common effluent treatment plants, they have total solid disposal facilities for their hazardous waste, and they have scientifically designed landfill areas so that there is no pollution caused to the different uh, biotic and abiotic components of our environment. Then came the vehicular pollution case, case, which was again a landmark judgment of 1992, where a retired uh, judge of the Supreme Court was appointed and three members were recommending measures for control of uh, vehicular pollution nationwide. So they uh, had given orders for lead-free petrol and use of natural gas. And again, CNG was introduced in Delhi after this landmark case. So again, CNG outloads, uh, outlets were provided and clean fuel in Delhi was introduced. And again, India was uh, introduced, a, uh, introduced as a party to Euro 2 norms. Okay, so Delhi was the first city in the world which came, uh, which came to have a complete public transportation running on CNG. And there was a child labor case. Again, uh, we, uh, you, you will see how environmental issues are extended to other social uh, and uh, uh, other social dimensions of our society. So exploitation of child labor was being done in Siva Kasi match and fireworks fact factories and around 1 million children, they were working in these hazardous industries. So due to directions from Supreme Court, all the kind of child labor which was being uh, uh, used in our country under 14 years of age, they came into picture and they the this Supreme Court directed all the states to identify any child fo children forced into labor and they came out with schemes for their rehabilitation. So after this child labor in hazardous industries was completely banned. Then the landmark case of groundwater pollution, which uh, direct, which was uh, judgment is was given in March 1996, where small chemical industries they were owned by a single owner, they were operating without any effluent treatment plant. So the 14 villages which were there in the vicinity of that uh, 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 in chemical industry, they were getting toxic effluents uh, emitted, generated from that industry. So for six years, uh, this uh, battle uh, continued in the court. And after that, the Department of Environment and Forest was given direction to recover the cost of eco restoration from the industries, who, which were so polluter pays principle was applied under this landmark case. 
so again uh, somebody asked me yesterday about where, where can we find all latest circulars so this is the site of uh, moef and this is the option given uh, for circulars so you can see all latest mandates and all latest up updations on environment related guidelines under this link and this is again for all different kind of rules and regulations related with environment public liability insurance forest conservation indian forest service ngt esa economic special zones okay then this is for the genetic materials for cdms what kind of project approvals are required and you will also get the copies of uh, uh, reports which are already submitted copies of cases which have been approved what kind of environment environment impact assessment reports are approved and what are the our reports which have been objected so all this data is available in public domain on these links okay so i have shared uh, three uh, screenshots of uh, moef sites and rest you can explore yourself thank you so Now, if you have any questions, I would like to take up those questions to resolve your queries.